Tonight on Love and Respect, two-time WNBA champion and Atlanta Dream co-owner, Renee Montgomery. There's little girls right now that say they want to grow up and play in the NBA, and I'm like, but why? My whole life, we play like for the honor. We we aren't making we weren't making very much money. We still aren't making a lot of money compared to the men's side. So we play for the growth of the league. And then yeah. you, if you have little girls coming up saying they don't even want to play in the league, it's like, baby, we building this for you. Absolutely. Like and this is for you. Renee Montgomery coming up right now. Renee Montgomery, welcome What's to up? Love and Respect. I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> I'm so impressed by you as a player and transitioning to an owner. You've accomplished so much in basketball on and off the court. What made you, and this is a dad of a daughter that just made JV. Okay. So shouts out to Michael Marie. <laughs> Come on. What Michael. made you fall in love with basketball? You know, it's it's Kind of when you're the youngest, so you talked about you have a daughter. Well, I'm the youngest. I have two older sisters. And when they were playing sports, I was playing sports. So they started playing basketball. I started playing basketball. And I just developed a love for it. They went on to do cheerleading track and major it. I had to let them rock because that wasn't, that wasn't my vibe. Okay? But I stuck with basketball, and I kind of fell in love with, like, trying to be better because I wasn't good when I started. I know, like, people – I know it's like people get surprised – I was strictly defense. I came in when the good player was tearing us up, and our coach would be like, all right, it's time for you to do your thing, you know? So I fell in love with trying to earn minutes and then trying to be a part of the team and then trying to be, like, one of the main characters on the team. What made you work hard to be a champion? You know, because when you're not yeah. good at something at first as a kid, yeah. usually you want to quit, but you didn't quit. No, you know, that's, that's what drove me, honestly. Like, what kind of kept my energy going was, first of all, I knew I was in West Virginia, so there wasn't any pro athletes coming out of West Virginia. There wasn't a, a lot of other athletes in general. Shouts to Randy Mom. People yeah. know that Shouts he came out. out. Randy, you know what I'm saying? Shouts to my guy, Jason, right? Jason Williams, mm -hmm. White Chocolate. So yeah. we had the fact that you can name the couple that came from <laughs> West Virginia should tell you exactly what we were dealing with. So I knew that I had like the odds kind of stacked against me, and I felt like I said I, I like that. I was like, all right, well, let's see what we can do. And so it started out as I told you, we I was coming off the bench heavy. And when I say heavy, meaning I was happy to get in the game if I got in the game. And then we started playing AAU and traveling, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about every day I was just working on my dribbles. I was working on my handles. Shooting, I know I'm known as a shooter now, but shooting wasn't really my thing in the beginning. So I just started to want to win. Yeah. Like it was like, oh, I see when, I, when we win as a team, you know, we get love. So yeah. it didn't matter if I scored a lot of points or what I did. And so that started my championship drive, like my championship mentality. Cause it was like, look, if we win, we all win. So why don't we just try to get more wins? We don't get in trouble at practice. And then it just became a habit, and then it just became like an addiction. Did you get mad when you lost? Oh, come on. Like, yes. I, like, losing was the worst. Winning was like, all right, cool. But losing, that's where, you know, I'm watching, I watch all the games over, by the way. I'm an overstudier, but when we lose, yeah, I don't, I, I didn't handle that well. In broadcasting, it's kind of like that. Yep. You watch your shows to see what I did good, what I didn't do so good, what I can prove on yep. next show. As a broadcaster, it's something, you know, it's just host I've had to do, and you know, you cringe sometimes. Oh, you see your stuff. hate hearing my voice on there. <laughs> <laughs> what inspired you to learn broadcasting, though? Know, yeah. Because a lot of people, you know, once they retire, they're off to the Bahamas. It's been a cool run. Broadcasters are like, are what keeps you in the sport. Randy does an amazing job, yeah. speaking of West Virginians. Howard Cosell used to do a great job. Cheryl Miller, Cheryl, Candace Cheryl, Parker. I mean, Char yeah, can't, dope broadcasters. Yes. What made you say, I'm going into broadcasting? You know, I went to school for it. So a lot of people, you know, don't know. I was a communications major at UConn. I knew that in any type of business, you have to communicate. Yeah. And I knew that communication was one of my, like we call them our superpowers. Like I don't have a problem talking to people yeah. and I feel comfortable talking to people. So when they said, what do you want to major? And I'm like, communications, yeah. let me major in something that I can use for different things. But I knew that with sports, there weren't very many other avenues. It's you're an athlete, you go be a coach, or you go be a broadcaster. Yeah. So I wanted to stay around sports and that's kind of what got me into it. But as I started to get into communications more, I started to see like entertainment as a whole is communications yeah. and and so I was like 
I want to be in entertainment, mm -hmm. whether it was broadcasting, being an analyst. I knew that like I wanted to be around energy and action. And yeah. you see a lot of times with entertainers when we link up with when athletes link up with rappers or athletes yeah. link up with entertainers. Everybody feels comfortable together because we're all doing sort yeah. of the same thing. Or well, they get locked up for weed in France. You know, like you know my what man, I'm saying? Baby, free little baby. You know what I'm saying? Free <laughs> but I had them problems, okay? <laughs> I will say, though, I remember when I was younger, broadcasters did not look like us, per se. Right. You know, it was it was people from outside our community commenting on athletes that were from our community. They did a good enough job, but yeah. I can say, you know, uh, an influx of black and brown folks Come on coming in the broadcasting booth, Come on you now. know, an influx of actual women, you know, calling the games and women's games yeah. have made for a lot better in terms of understanding the cross-section of culture and sports. It's been great to see people who look like my little girl as we're Come watching games together. You got Michael, I got a son, Junior, and so imagine if they were able to see us young. They can, but yeah. For us, we had to dream. It yeah. was an amount like I had to think of something that I didn't actually see in real life. Absolutely. I was like, I want to be a WNBA player from West Virginia. Well, there was none before that. But you know what I mean? I had to think of that, dream of that. And I think that's why it's important. I mean, even us sitting here, this is unconventional. Yeah, <laughs> Come on, like, it is. Rapper Killer Mike is interviewing me. That's an like everything about what's going on is unconventional, and I love it because there's going to be people like you that like yes, you're a broadcaster now, you're a host. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You do what you thought this out here, okay? You're gonna have me blessing. <laughs> but you overcame a lot, like in terms of size. So people yeah. expect you to be big. You are not. Yeah. People expect you to as small to be get pushed around a lot. You didn't. You were you were tenacious on court, <laughs> tenacious shooter. Overcame just being defensive only. You watched a couple of clips or whatever. What's she doing? Okay. You gotta do your homework. You gotta do your homework, dog. <laughs> but you're a triple threat. Yeah. Heck of an athlete, heck of a broadcaster, mm -hmm. and now owner. Yeah. How did you parlay ownership in a, in a time Man. where it seems like more former players are looking to become business people, owners, and more attributes are, are being shown than just I can shoot a ball? What brought you to ownership in the WNBA? It's crazy because that wasn't part of the plan. You know, I remember talking to Diana Taurasi at NBA All-Star in Chicago, and uh, she was talking about, like, yo, what you going to do afterwards, you know, like, just – we just shooting the breeze and she was like I want ownership and I was like oh that's dope for you you know I was thinking yeah. like for her like that's dope for you and then as the pandemic happened I opted out of the WNBA in 2020 and we wanted to do something big I'm like if I'm opting out of the WNBA I need to have some type of big impact almost the sh like we didn't have to show why I opted out but I wanted to show look this is why I'm opting out and it started with protest and it was happening at Centennial yeah. Olympic Park. Yeah. We threw a pop-up block party, you know, yeah. Juneteenth, let's celebrate. Yeah. There's not much to celebrate right now, but let's get to yeah, it. Absolutely. And then, you know, my wife, we just announced that we're married. Uh, my wife, Serena Gray, thank you. She was like, you know, the dream might be up for sale soon. So you need to try to start thinking about that. I'm like, girl, what, what money? You know, like, I had to start <laughs> like, what do you know that I don't know? And she just saw me there. And that's why it's good. Like, I always talk about teams around you because people see us on camera right now, but you know, you got a monster team around you. Mm -hmm. I got a team around me that's killing it. And so I can't take ownership of being an owner of the dream without mentioning my team because yeah. they're the ones that even as I started telling my parents and my family and they're like girl yes do it and I'm like everybody sees me like this is not a big deal like yeah. everybody was like confirmed and felt strong about like yes do it you can do it so then I went about trying to figure out how I can make it happen we were calling VCs we were talking to different people and then you know we got linked up with Suzanne A. Bear and Larry G like-minded people we both saw the same vision of where we wanted to take the dream and bomb here we are so it's first of all it's refreshing to see an owner with dope braids so I mean, <laughs> okay. let me just say that man you know that's a, you know what i mean okay. swagging on them <laughs> what what um, in the WNBA, you guys have led the way on many issues. Like 99% of the players are even vaccinated. Come on, not like. It's I, 99. 99%. <laughs> I don't even know if 99% of my family's vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, man, y'all did a better job convincing. <laughs> what brings that advocacy to you guys' league? And, yeah. and what, what was so important about health advocacy in terms of vaccinations for you guys? You know, just if you look at how the WNBA is made up, we're made up of the minority. We're majority minority. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, we're used to being discriminated against. We're used to having to stand up for stuff. Black women are at the lowest threshold pretty much when it comes to anything. You know, it, you know, it's 
it's just how the totem pole is working and I think that because we're so used to dealing with it and you got to remember women we're ready to turn up if somebody comes at somebody we love so yeah. women are going to not only just stand up for what we believe in but if we see something going on with you yeah. oh no baby it's time to plot plan strategy uh, okay like, and mobilize okay like oh real. no baby it's time to grow and so I think that when you get a large group 144 women all educated, all went to school, all understand what's going on. The WNBA is comprised of a lot of women that know what they want and are gonna, not going to be shy about it. So you're a team owner, you're a former player, you're a yeah. broadcaster, you're a businesswoman. What's marriage like and what's raising a black man like it in the in the in the swell of what it's today's America for you. Well, first of all, nobody. Why aren't y'all rapping about how lit married life is? First of all, I don't hear. Well, him. I do. I am the. I am. I started the whole show. I your follow, wife on the internet. But so that's yeah. you know yeah, what? Because yeah, I, I, I follow you and yeah. you. I like how you move. So you know yeah. what? I'm following on Twitter though because I told you. Yeah. That. <laughs> but I like how you move where you exalt the woman that you love. Absolutely. But you know, a lot of times. People need to know their married life is lit. We can watch Ted Lasso together. Yeah. We can talk storylines, plots, but then you already know you got somebody in your foxhole at all times. That's yeah. what for me, it's like when you're out here in these different spaces and the entertainment industry is like the sports industry. It's competitive. It's tough. Yeah. You never know. But to have a solid rock beside you, that's for me what marriage yeah. is. It's like I know somebody that like we going to war. I don't care where it's at. I don't care what happened. We going to war together. And so for me, that part is lit. Raising a son in this environment, a black boy, is is difficult because yeah. he's so innocent. Like, he'll look at stuff. He's still asking, why did they attack Ahmaud Arbery? Like, I don't understand what, like, what happened? And I was like, there's no answer for that. Like, yeah. you know, like, it's almost like you want to keep his innocence, but he also has to be aware. We need you to be aware because if you do get in a situation, it's not a game because he, he's jokey, he playful all the time. If you get in a situation, it's not a game. You need to be respectful because yeah. they don't see you like I see a little baby. They yeah. see, you know, they might see just a threat. A threat, yeah. And so for me, that's the hardest part. It's like keeping that innocence, but also still making him aware yeah. of where we are in reality. In terms of HBCUs, in a world of people thinking stuff outside of their community is yeah. better. I always like to remind people that you know how the leaders went to HBCUs, the people that, that are up on your grandpa's wall and your grandmother's uh, wall. The people that are in office right now, shout to our VP. Absolutely. I we're, mean, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Absolutely. I'm talking about, it ain't even the past history. I want people to know current history went Absolutely. there too. Absolutely. Current. And, 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 and a lot of times I think what people forget is what, what we're missing a lot of times in the African-American community is not competence, it's confidence. Mm. And a lot of times smaller classes, a professor that looks like you and understands you, a professor that may be from the same background or a similar one is going to help you. I had a white art instructor at, um, at a center we went to on Saturdays. I was in the Art Talent Center in, in my high school. She's a white woman, but I didn't know she had grew up poor. So me and Larry Newton were in her class, and she could understand that we didn't have the same monies to buy materials the other kids. She said, so this is what we're going to do, because I was poor. We painted with coffee. Wow. So she literally went and got coffee, hot water, and taught us to do, when we did our watercolors, we did them in shades of brown. She says, not having is not an excuse. We're going to find a way That's or make great. a way. And I can remember being in college and the same thing. Professors understood where we were from. So they pull us to the side sometimes to say, hey, this is the obstacle you're facing. Yes. We're not going to create an excuse to not not challenge that, we're going to overcome that obstacle and this is how we're going to do it. Love so it. a big part of historical black college and universities is getting that attention and that, that confidence you need to push through. So I want to Never under talented. You. you know, like that's what people, HBCUs are never under talented. They're just usually underfunded. Yeah. And so you start to look at the things and what, why don't we have confidence? Yeah. You know, like, because imagine if teachers were pouring into us the same way your art teacher was starting young, you yeah. would have confidence in everything you do. And so we got to instill confidence in each other. Like Absolutely. that's why when I see somebody, you know, I just show love because that's if we all started doing that, imagine. Absolutely. Like, imagine if I was trying to think from your position, you know what I mean? Like, I look at you, you could be like, Killer Mike, you were poor. Like, you know what I mean? People, <laughs> you know what I mean? But people probably see where you are now, and that's good that people know that, like, where you start. Talk about class for a hot second, because mm -hmm. if you're the only black kid, but you're a black kid, parents who went to HBCU, yeah. your confidence is probably through the roof. But I'm sure you were there with poor white children, too. Sure. And for there's sure. a miseducation that happens in this country that keeps poor people separate. It, 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 it tells poor white people, your skin is enough, right. yet they don't have the resources it takes to escape poverty. They don't have the resources it takes to identify when they're being yeah. hustled. Like the West Virginian right now is holding up a bill that could potentially help, yeah. you know, old Joe, you know, no. not Biden, the other guy, uh, no. is holding up what Mansion. could potentially help people. Yeah. Um, I don't always name my ops, but. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, nah, it's all good. 
But it's good to name because his constituency needs to know that what he's doing is wrong. And it doesn't just hold up black people or CRT or whatever thing you think. It, it really is holding poor white people. And when you talk about the bottom of the Appalachian, Tennessee, rural Alabama, yeah. when you start talking about North Florida, South Georgia, um, poor white people are as duped by education. They are as, they're as duped by health care and politicians. You know, having grown up in that environment where you got a chance to see the best of us and sometimes the worst conditions for them, what was that like as a kid? And what advice do you have for us as a country in terms of mending past race and, and, and according to class to kind of push for better for all of us? You know, I think if people started to just look at <clears throat> the similarities. It's hard to do because all we look, look at is the differences at first. Like yeah. our society, the first thing we focus on is how are we different? Mm -hmm. You're a man, I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's the first thing that people recognize, even in sports. Yeah. Like we talked about how it's broken up. And it's the same way when it comes to, to gender and class in a sense of if you're white, then it doesn't matter what class you are in people's minds. It's like, well, at least you're white. Yeah. But you got the same struggles as we do. And we're black, you yeah. know, it doesn't matter that you're you're white in this instance. If you're living below the poverty line, you're in the same group as everyone else living below that poverty line. When we talk about voting and some people are like, you know, I'm not into it or I don't know, no, sis, that ain't me. It's like, well, what are we going to use our power for then? During the pandemic, the gap is only growing. Yeah. The poverty line is getting, the people under it is growing. And so I saw in West Virginia, I did see a lot of poverty, but I also saw that there was that divider, yeah. like, you know, and, and it's interesting because my parents, I did come from black excellence, you know, both educated. My mom was a college professor at that time, so the confidence was through the roof. And then I had two sisters that tried if you want to, you know, like yeah. I, I knew I had that confidence walking around and we're like, ain't nobody talking crazy to me. I got two older sisters that ain't yeah. playing that. But when you're in a school, yeah, you, you start to see, you start to wonder, like, why would you hate on me? We're the same. Yeah. But people don't see that. They see that, no, no, you're a black girl. Even if I'm living in poverty and, you're, and I'm a white yeah. guy, we're not the same. And I'm like, yeah, we are. You're into female-led companies, food for the homeless, ensuring access to voting. Yep. What's your top focus now? I know that there are going to be big elections in 2022. Yep. But past politics and past whatever social thing is, you mm -hmm. know, taking up this quarter, what is the one thing you could say, this is my lifetime mission to focus on this cause, to make sure that this is eradicated or this thing is indoctrinated in us for the for the good? What 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 would your legacy in that be? Yeah. Philanthropic or otherwise? What would I think it's just like advancement. And what I mean by advancement is we talked about it. The women receive four percent of media coverage when it comes to sports, but yeah. 2% of venture capital funds go to women. Like people, yeah, so women-led founders or women-led startups, 2% of all the money goes to women. Why, I do not know. Women are creating companies just as well as men. Mm -hmm. And so, and then if you look at minorities, the number's still just as low as well. Mm -hmm. So I think when it comes to advancement, with me being a co-owner of the Atlanta Dream, I'm like saying the Atlanta Dream everywhere, like come through, of course I see he's waiting for you, Killer Mike. Like, I'm coming. Yeah, come through because like the more people pay attention to the problems, the more light is shed on it, the more we can advance, and that's women and minorities. So, and then me being a general partner at Valor Ventures, that's what we're doing. We're investing in minority startups, we're investing in women-led startups because that's the new way that money's being built. You know, a lot of times people don't know, like there's trends of money in the past, Gener like generational inheritance was how families, you know, you pass the money down from family to family. Those are the people you t typically saw at the top of the wealth charts. Not anymore. Yeah. The people at those wealth charts are startups, yeah. founders, early employees to those founders. Well, then who's getting that money? It ain't us. Yeah. And so I would just say, like, my legacy, it's just the advancement of minorities and women in whatever avenue that is, sports, venture capital, whatever it is, like we gotta start taking it up. We know now the numbers, the facts are out there. The numbers are out there, we know them. How can we change them? Yeah. One, one more, the, the big three. Yeah. Does, does it does it make sense? Is the big three gonna grow? Are the we big gonna, three league? Yeah, the oh, big three league. Oh, okay. Are we gonna, so, oh, you like, yeah, I'm, I'm into basketball. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so does the big three grow? And if it grows, do we see, uh, um, 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 an intersex league because my thing is with a big three man you could have three That's people true. on the court you could have two women one man one you know we could we could do it a lot of different ways but I like where your head's at yeah. I like where your head's at come on because Lisa Leslie was the coach of one of the championship teams so there's already an infusion of 
women into that world. And I think with Ice Cube and what they're doing over there, yeah. I don't think they'd be opposed to it. When we talk about the big three, athleticism is out of the equation anyway. You know, like this is some players though actually are still in their prime, but yeah. some players are past that prime and they're playing yeah. that fundamental basketball. And so I could actually see it working because, you know, a lot of times like if you put a man versus a woman up in, a, in playing one on one in their prime, there's physical attributes that might make that game not as exciting. Yeah. But when you talk about the big three and how the, the it's set up yeah. and I mean it's half court, you yeah. ain't running up and down the court. I, I, I would do. argue though there's some sports like when Billie Jean King beat the reporter who was talking trash. That was just, she drug him. I would He's the, not a yeah. professional. I, I'm talking yeah. about real I, athletes. I would say he had no business trying to do it go against Serena her. Serena in her prime. <laughs> Yeah. I would have loved to see go against McEnroe in his prime. I would uh, look now. I, that, I would have loved shouts to see King that. Richard. I yeah. would have loved to see that as well. That in would a have sense been of, I mean, but even still, I don't even think it's, it's needed, though. Yeah. You know, like Serena is doing her thing on her side of things. And, you know, like sports are never going to become unisex in yeah. general. So that's but the big three, that's a good situation where it could. Sure. But, you know, I don't like because there's little girls right now that say they want to grow up and play in the NBA. And I'm like, but why? My whole life. We play like for the honor. We we aren't making we weren't making very much money. We still aren't making a lot of money compared to the men's side. So we play for the honor. We play for the growth of the league. And then yeah. you, if you have little girls coming up saying they don't even want to play in the league, it's like, baby, we building this for you. Absolutely. Like this is for you. Absolutely. I expect to see more coaching, more more dominant players. Yeah. I expect to see the audience grow. Yeah. And uh, we got to make sure we get that music that get bucking. Let's in go. So. Man, Renee Montgomery, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm talking to a superstar, talking to an owner, talking to a leader, talking to a wife, talking to a mother, and I've been honored to talk to you with love and respect. I appreciate it. So we just met, right? but I feel love. like we kind of fell or whatever after that. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs>